do, please help me welcome Dr. David Sutter. Okay, thanks. It's great to be here. Um, this is great, such a nice venue, and you guys are in for a treat, as I'm sure you know. I, if this is the first time seeing Jurassic Park. For any of you, I'd be very surprised. Um, it's such a classic one, and you've got to see it in a venue like this. Um, yeah, my name is David Sunderland. I'm a uh, paleontologist by training, a paleoecologist, how things work together um, and how our, they're preserved to understand something about the past. And many paleontologists are part of geology departments, and I am at, at Lafayette College and have been there for eight years. Um, my specialty is in fossil wood, amber leaves from the high Arctic um, in Alaska where I reconstruct ancient uh, environments and ecologies and forested systems. But like all paleontologists, we have some expertise that crosses the whole um, sort of types of organisms and plants and animals and things like that. So what I aim to do here to give you some context for Jurassic Park and paleontology in general is show you how paleontology is nested within geology. I don't know if there's any geologists in the crowd. If there are, raise your hand, anyone? Okay, well, it's, geology is this fascinating discipline, and many people have, a, have an impression of it that's it's different what, than what actually is the case. Um, geology is all sorts of study of the earth, whether it is volcanoes uh, or beaches or river systems or glaciers or oceanographic um, ex, uh, research and exploration into different chemistries and temperatures of different portions of the ocean, the mineralogical structure and properties of the pieces that make up rocks. Minerals are the building blocks of rocks. How these rocks are in concert, moving with each other through plate tectonics, and then we can witness it in the um, in earthquakes and seismographs uh, like this. And in paleontology is one of the sort of subspecialties in geology, which is to say this study of ancient life as preserved in rocks. Now, geologists are crazy. Um, they do all sorts of great things, uh, like wander off to Utah or to South America. My work's in Alaska, like I said. I've worked in Greenland and Iceland and Ecuador and places like this. Looking at the record of rocks and what they can tell us about ancient worlds, how the world works over longer time scales and bigger spatial scales than we can appreciate being lowly humans. Um, and we gather data and have a ball doing it. And we know a lot about this Earth um, from the examination of the evidence that's caught in the Earth's system as rocks and as fossils. This evidence um, shows us that we, the Earth is huge, right? We can actually observe this, and it's, and it's quite old. Um, just how huge? Well, we're talking about 4,000 miles to the core. Um, for, that's the radius of the Earth is about 4,000 miles, a gigantic place. The atmosphere, uh, for perspective, would be about as thin. You think about how, how tall the atmosphere, how large, how far clouds up go into the upper trop troposphere. That is about as thin as the oil on a slick bowling ball. The atmosphere is only that fine veneer on the outside. This place is gigantic. And it's super old. Um, to give you a sense of how old, watch this. I've created this little uh, diagram and uh, animation here in PowerPoint. It's going to run across the screen. So the Earth forms 4.6 billion years ago. Okay, so that's a that's a number that has almost no meaning for for us. We can't really conceptualize that. Um, but the Earth forms, and then we wait, and we wait. And animals come around in the last ninth, and then plants, and then humans. Um, so this first eight ninths of Earth history is somewhat uneventful, if you. Think about it as far as um, sort of the morphological diversity of life. But really, there's a lot of stuff going on. The same thing uh, running again. The Earth forms. Really, the moon was born close after that. Meteorite impact the Earth quite extensively with first liquid oceans back then. Photosynthesis begins around 2.5 billion years ago. Oxygen appears in the atmosphere around 2.1 billion years ago. Algae originates just there. Animals, plants, extinction. Look at all the, the, the ice ages, birds come about, and dinosaurs, and all of that within the last ninth of Earth history. Sort of wild to think about. Um, the idea of Pangea, which everyone sort of thinks is like the origin dawn of Earth, it's really not. That's the last 18th of Earth history when that thing came about and been subsequently splitting up. So we have um, this sense of time in geology, which is 
uh, unique as part of, of, of science. There's some great metaphors, just to give you a sense. If you scale the time of Earth against a mile, about a fourth of the mile is done. You're starting to regret even starting um, by the time life originates. Over halfway, about 800 feet left in the mile, an animals come around. Plants, with only 264 feet, dinosaurs originate, if they're scaled to a mile. Two feet and three inches ago, if you scale it like this, is when the ice ages were. And the last quarter of, the inch of, of an inch was when the last ice age was, around 20,000 years ago. To say nothing of, like, your coming into existence within the last fraction of a second. Um, against a year, we have these scale. It's not until November 12th, against a whole year, that animals come around as complex organisms on the planet. Vertebrates don't walk onto the land until just before December. Dinosaurs of the vertebrates don't come around until mid-December. New Year's Eve dinner, modern humans come. Ryan Seacrest comes on TV to begin the, the countdown during the Ice Ages, and the ball drops on New York City in the last Ice Age, is to say the start. And all of this is, is told to us by the geologic record. So we know all this cool stuff by looking at evidence. And whether you're 5 or 55 or 75, um, there's some sort of neat uh, mental exercises you can do to sort of understand how it is that geologists figure stuff out. So here is my uh, metaphor for the detective work that we do. So what did you have for lunch maybe at school or at work today? But I, I'm not going to ask you directly. I'm going to find out somehow. Now here's how I'm going to find out. You can look in the dumpster out behind the back of the school. The remains of the process of eating lunch are caught in the ruins in that dumpster. Or maybe I could take a look at your shirt to see what kind of um, ketchup or pizza stain or something might be on you. There's evidence that we can get, just like a detective would, to figure out something about the past. And so we are these detectives. We can dive down into the layers of trash of ruins of material that's been deposited and learn that perhaps pizza was for lunch on Monday and then hoagies on Tuesday and then spaghetti on Wednesday by reading from the bottom to the top and understanding something about the evolution of lunch in your office space or in your school, right? And this is the same way that rocks get deposited on the planet. From oldest in the bottom to youngest on the top, the, the action of Muddy river flow. This is at the confluence of the Lehigh and Delaware and Easton over um, near Lafayette. And you can see mud is on its way down past Philadelphia to drop into, this, into the Atlantic Ocean down there and become part of the geologic record. And it's going to preserve anything that goes down there. God knows what goes down the Delaware River, um, but maybe some, some wood, some other things that shouldn't be going down the river um, are going to be preserved in this record and they're going to be preserved as a top layer. Right? So this is the way layers lay out in the geologic record. Sea levels fall, mountains uplift, exposing these layers for us to take a look at. From the bottom to the top of the Grand Canyon, you get a sequence of environments and time as told by the rocks that are laid by the ruins of former continents. Does that make sense? It's a fascinating way to think about your vacations anywhere. To go looking out the window as you drive 75 or whatever, what, 65, I should say, a miles an hour down the highway, looking at mountainscapes and thinking, boy, these were once the lowlands, not the uplands. These are the ruins of former uplands that themselves have been pushed up, and let's go bounce around and see what's preserved in those. That's what paleontologists do. So this is an, uh, sort of a walkthrough mental um, exercise here. So maybe a super long time ago, there was an ocean that was let to evaporate. And salt, just like will, that will evaporate if you just let um, you know, dishwater sort of uh, evaporate off, will collect at the bottom. And then maybe perhaps there's sand comes blowing in in a sand dune type of environment. So from salt deposits at the bottom to sand dune deposits over top to maybe sea level rises. Not so long ago, but still there's uh, sea level rises and deposits these muds onto the bottom, shallow sea muds. We get salt, sand, and then shaley kind of deposits, and then maybe the sea level falls away, and erosion continues to slice down little canyons into this, these layered strata. And then you arrive on the scene and think, wow, this is an archive of the geologic history of the planet. 
I wonder what's in it, I wonder who's in it, and try and figure out what's um, the history of that place. How interesting this is. I just love geology. It's more than just the rocks. It's what the story that they tell. It's the epic history as recorded by the earth in an autobiographical way. Fascinating. So you read these rocks and you get the hike out of the Grand Canyon from older to younger. Um, and these tell us what it was like in the past and how this whole planet has changed. Evolution of life, the evolution of sea level, of all these things going on in concert in this great history. So paleontology comes into this where we get the preservation of organisms in these layers. There's three different kinds of rocks you've probably heard about. Sedimentary, that's good for this. Igneous and metamorphic. Igneous and metamorphic rocks rarely preserve fossils because they're either super hot or super um, pressurized in the Earth's system. Paleontology concentrates on the sedimentary record and who is preserved in those. Most paleontologists actually work on things other than dinosaurs. Um, the fossil record of clams, of plants, of bacteria, of things like that to tell us about how the Earth system works. The general way that things get preserved is this way. So imagine some type of organism that looks like a halfway between a deer and a dog. Don't ask me really what it is, but um, there's this living animal that maybe falls dead and can get scavenged, can get rained on, can get um, sort of plant root grow through. There's some sort of degeneration of what the original form was during that time. And then through sedimentation processes, like the, the river dumping sediment on top of it, it can get preserved as a different sort of accumulation of hard parts in there. And then somebody can walk up to those, find those occasionally exposed in erosion, and bring them back into the museum, go about sort of piecing them together, not only with bone to bone, but how the ecosystem that contained that organism works. So that's the taking of life through its degradation and death, and the work of paleontologists to uncover excellent specimens of organisms, learning something about the change of life through time. And so things can preserve in petrified ways, like that petrified wood up there. They can be replaced. And no shell should make itself out of pyrite, iron sulfide. It would just not be a good thing to float around in. Um, but it has been replaced, in this case, in the center. Um, impressions, this is a fossil insect wing, as impressed into sediment. Fossil plants is carbonized there. And even amber, which unaltered preservation sort of keeps insect forms uh, relatively unchanged sometimes even chemically unchanged um, from their original uh, preservation. The stuff I work on in Alaska is about 55 million years old. It's amazing um, preservation in amber. Permafrost, tar, things like that. I've, noticed pale I've known paleontologists who have actually eaten mammoth so well preserved with sort of freezer burn around the outside of it in, this, in the sort of um, center of Siberia. Incredible preservation. It's about 10,000-year-old meat. So things get preserved. And what we learn from that is that organisms have changed quite substantially from long ago in the geologic past, where things like trilobites are scooting around the seafloor, to weird, I call them sort of Dr. Seuss-looking worlds of organisms that don't really make up much of the diversity in the world today, but doing so quite extensively. This is the kind of place like Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania would have looked a heck of a lot like this um, just about 370 million years ago. And then more modern ecosystems in the marine condition. But then if you do this across the um, terrestrial world, something in the Permian, to something in the Jurassic, to something just in the Pleistocene about 20,000 years ago, maybe right here in Pennsylvania. We learn about these and can create these reconstructions of who's living with whom, plants, animals, birds, pterosaurs, um, by the fossil record that they leave. And they leave it in this way that's much like a dumpster. The earth records itself from bottom to top. So what we can also learn is our place in this whole thing. Of the diversity of life, we are one of these um, and have an amazing sort of uh, spread of ourselves across the planet. But we are just one of these organisms um, that has been evolving for 3.8 billion years of geologic history. And in fact, our ancestry is in all that of all vertebrates, and that is founded within the fishes. So should, we should embrace our inner fish. Now, you guys came here um, with the goal of seeing dinosaurs, and you're going to in Jurassic Park. Um, dinosaurs are an amazing uh, lineage 
that survives today. This catastrophic scene at the end of the Cretaceous um, is uh, thought to be the extinction of the dinosaurs. We do know that dinosaurs survived. Some of them did survive through this extinction and are now um, the, the stem birds um, from which all bird diversity has come is relatives in the what we call the theropod lineage of dinosaurs, T-Rex, Velociraptor, and other things like that. So, but there's this glory world of these large organisms back in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. And we have, um, I brought in a couple specimens, some big bones, uh, femur bones, of some of these characters that you'll see in the movie. Triceratops is a Cretaceous beast, though it appears in Jurassic Park. In fact, most of the dinosaurs you see are Cretaceous in Jurassic Park, not Jurassic. It's um, Cretaceous, more diversity of dinosaurs. Around 70 million years ago, this is an herbivorous dinosaur, as you guys know and will see. Um, and it's a quadruped walking around on four feet, sort of like your modern dog would, um, but of course much larger. The cattle um, of the uh, Cretaceous, along with uh, Lambiosaurs and other things like that. Um, Tyrannosaurus, the theropod, and this is a group that gave rise to birds after this, um, is also a Cretaceous beast. We do have evidence of this Triceratops femur here, this, which was found in uh, North Dakota and has been uh, replicated here in plastic. It's still heavy. Um, has been actually chewed on. You see these little holes here? They match up with T-Rex skulls um, that are found in the same South Dakota, or North Dakota um, Hell Creek beds. Um, amazing uh, preservation of some of these things. And the T-Rex itself, of course, is a biped walking around on two feet. And this is its left femur bone. Knee down here, hip joint up here. Your left femur from here to here is only as big as it is. Um, this is not only the height of the thing um, to put its hip up around there, the lower leg bone comes down here, and the sort of, you've seen the reconstructions, they sort of walk on their toes. So this is quite a place, uh, quite a, a big animal, and uh, living at the same time as Triceratops. So carnivorous, of course, in a biped. And then the last one that I brought in here is Apatosaurus. Um, this is a big left femur bone. I can't hold that up with my arm. Um, this is a Jurassic beast, actually. This bolt is, you'll see, Apatosaurus, sometimes called Brontosaurus, um, though Apatosaurus is more correct. Herbivorous and a quadruped itself. Now we can learn a lot about these and be like, gosh, wow, look at these giant organisms. They're huge. Um, but we can also learn about how they lived, what they ate. You'll see some um, sort of portions of the movie that have to do with the defecation and copper lights of, of sick um, triceratops. We can learn about what they, what they ate and what their diet was in that fashion. We can learn a little bit about how they ran by comparing them to modern relatives and modern organisms. We can't get back there with a radar gun to see how fast they were but we can make models of how fast organisms are today, scale that to what dinosaurs may have been in the past, and we can use the fossil trackways that are all abundant all over the, all over the planet, including um, here in Pennsylvania, down toward Doylestown, there's preservation of trackways um, from early Jurassic um, dinosaurs that are running around. And this is a, a paleontologist sitting on a rippled um, sort of seashore back then with dinosaurs tromping around, leaving these tracks. And these can be mapped out, um, and the measurements of the tracks, the girth of the bones and how much muscle mass they could contain, the attachment of muscle scars onto the bones, and all of this can be scaled and compared to like an ostrich or to an elephant or something like this, and we can get a pretty good estimate of how fast things can run. You will see in Jurassic Park the... Um, Chase scene, which is a classic one, of Jeff Goldblum, I forget what his name is in the movie, but he's the sort of chaos theory guy, right? Sitting there in the van, hurt for some reason, I can't remember why, and there's these tremor impacts that he, he's somewhat alarmed, right, when he says this. And then everyone piles in, the, the music comes up, and off they race in this Jeep. It's a great looking Jeep. And it's moving along at, oh God, I wish I knew how many miles an hour it was. Because they never really show the speedometer. And 
the T-Rex is making, is gaining on him. When it seems like this guy's moving at least 25, 30 miles an hour by that time. The latest reconstructions of how fast a T-Rex could have run, sort of a bummer here, is about 18 miles an hour. The speed um, that this bone could take, scale to the best sort of analogs we have for that organism today, and the sort of muscle mass and their computer models, and we can do this with trackways, um, puts it at around 18 to 20 miles an hour for normal locomotion at, the, at a running pace. So that's sort of a, a buzzkill. Um, but think about all that you're watching here is informed. In fact, the anatomical reconstructions are really quite good in this movie. The ecology is totally right now. Um, these things are eating plants that they have no business eating because there's 100 million years between when that plant occurred and when the dinosaur occurred. But there's, it's a fun sort of exercise to watch this with a perspective of what we have learned about the geologic record, or about the paleontological record, has come from geology. And this record that the Earth is writing itself, preserving pieces here and there, um, to and we can sort of decipher this and understand as much as we can, comparing our modern organisms to that and the rock record from oldest to the youngest at the top. So I wish you guys a pleasant sort of viewing of this movie. It's a great one to look at with the paleontological mindset and geological uh, mindset as well. Um, trying to reconstruct in the ancient world um, piecemeal when the world has changed quite substantially since these organisms were walking around. Thanks for listening, and I'm sure you guys are going to enjoy the movie. Actually, I can take any questions. We have some time for questions, I think. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. So I've gotten um, some requests from people calling me on the phone and saying, hey, i got a dinosaur bone. I'd like to bring it in. I said, how big is it? Four feet long. Whoa. Um, well, I'll tell you what. I'll meet you down there, and I'll bring my car. He goes, no, I'll just carry it up the stairs, three flights. I'm like, sir, you, I can almost tell right away you don't have a dinosaur bone. Many dinosaur bones are permineralized, which is a petrified, sort of the way petrified wood is each of the pore spaces in there is filled with mineral. So that makes them essentially a rock. And if you have a four foot long rock as wide as that, you're not carrying it up three stairs. So it really would weigh a lot. I don't want to say a ton, because it could, well, could be a ton. Um, but in most of these would be far more than something you can carry. Yes, hello. What country, um, what country or state was the first dinosaur found? Well, I don't know about that globally. In the States, you may be surprised, it's actually in New Jersey. You know, Wyoming, Montana, those places are celebrated for their dinosaurs, right? It was actually found in New Jersey, and it uh, went to the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. Great place, a lot of history based out of there. It was the major museum early on. Yes? T-Rex, at, at about 18 miles an hour, could probably sustain that for quite a while, but uh, Usain Bolt, who just looked, who's been breaking world records, is moving about 23 miles an hour at top speed. So that guy could run away at least for 200 meters. Um, and then I, I assume Usain Bolt slows down at some point. Um, but yes, he's, he's, got, he's got some speed on the dinosaur for that short span. Take one more question, and then you guys can get to launch another kick on the movie. Yeah. Yeah, the people who ate the frozen woolly mammoth. Yes, yes. Did they say what it tasted like? Chicken. Really? No, no. Just no. No. Um, it's a it's a red meat. Uh, it's probably dry as can be. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I I don't remember their their impressions of it, but it was just like gosh, it's so well preserved that you can do that in permafrost. Unbelievable preservation out there, almost like a sub fossil. Yeah. We can find wood. Um, in fact, I've cooked dinner with over 500 or 55 million year old wood in Alaska. Oh, wow. It's crazy. Amazing preservation. Yes? Right. Um, the, 
most recent theory, and the one that seems to have a, a whole lot of support, is this um, what we call bolide, which could be a comet or a meteorite impacting New Mexico, spreading this chaos of warmth, cold, and just debris um, all over the Americas and then globally after that was one bad day um, and sort of several decades, centuries of chaos after that from about a 10 kilometer wide impact into the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. If you look at a Google Earth image of Mexico down by Cancun, you can actually see an arcuate shape of sinkholes and caves that is the um, sort of one piece of this circular impact structure that's 180 kilometers wide. It's a great, great story, and everything we find about the geologic record suggests that that was causal to the extinction. Thanks very much, guys. Enjoy the movie.